Hello everybody, welcome back to The Historian's Craft. So let's dive right into this one. In the modern day, while we do have alternative fuel sources like solar and like wind, most of the modern economy runs on fossil fuels, mainly oil and derivatives like gasoline. Before that, during the Industrial Revolution, the major source of energy was coal, another fossil fuel. And before that, the major source of fuel was wood, and a product derived from wood charcoal, and although there were other sources of energy like dried dung or straw or animal fat, really anything that would burn, or water power or wind in some instances, the major source of fuel was wood and coal. Now people also built stuff out of wood, sometimes quite a lot, like ships. Philip II of Spain, for instance, deforested large portions of his country for the famous Armada, which failed, so it wasn't even worth the effort. Which leads us to the topic of this video. How did ancient people simply not cut down all the trees? Well, this is a pretty big topic, so for the purposes of this video, we're going to be focusing on the Roman Empire. That being said, as far as the Roman Empire is concerned, there are essentially two answers to this question, so I'm going to cut the video in half in the interest of time. The second video is going to deal with the wood itself and how and why the Romans didn't really cut down all the forests and how they dealt with forest remanagement techniques, that sort of thing. This video is also going to explain why the Romans didn't cut down all the trees and look at an alternative fuel source in the classical world, which played a major role in providing energy to Roman civilization. Cultures based in the Mediterranean in antiquity often derived their food sources from what's sometimes referred to as the Mediterranean Triad, meaning wheat, grapes, and olives, and their associated products. And while cultures in the Mediterranean did consume a more varied diet than just these three crops, it formed a major portion of what they ate, certainly in Greece and Rome, but across the sea more broadly. And it's the last of these, olives, that actually formed the major alternative fuel source for the Roman Empire. So what did this look like? Well, our evidence for the use of olives as a fuel source extends actually to well before the start of the Roman period, and then it spikes during the Republic and during the Empire. Not surprising, I suppose, given that Roman hegemony essentially created the stable economic zone across the Mediterranean and across a decent portion of Europe, which saw a drastic rise in urbanization compared to what came before, and hence greater quantities of fuel were needed, and they also planted thousands of acres of olive trees. So basically what that means is that our evidence for this spans about 2000 to about 200 BC, and then the volume of that evidence begins to rise dramatically. And this evidence takes the form of what's known as pomace, or olive pomace, which is essentially the waste product that's left over after the olive is pressed to extract the oil. So it's the pit, much of the flesh, and a little bit of the oil left over as well. And just so we're all on the same page, the sources I'm using for this video are listed in the video description if you want to read them. And these were all published between about 2010 and about 2023. So this video is more or less a summary of what we currently know, but it could change very quickly in the next few years. The use of fuel is one of those things that hasn't been fully considered in studies of the Roman economy, for reasons I'm honestly not too sure on. Because if you talked about the modern global economy and you did not mention oil and gas, at some point, that discussion would fall apart and wouldn't really work. So as a result, we're getting a lot of new research from economic historians and from archaeologists about this topic. And it's also because for institutional or governmental reasons, like getting access to sites and that sort of thing, some countries, like the UK, publish their archaeological reports much more quickly than Spain or Portugal, so information about this is still gradually coming out as field reports are written up, submitted, and published. So with that said, what does our information about the use of olive pomace as a fuel source look like? Well, the first thing you have to grapple with is, if we're dealing with a period that spans thousands of years, the second millennium BC through the Roman era, how do you determine the presence of pomace in the material record? And then, because that was also a food source, how do you differentiate between the presence of olives for food versus the presence of olives for fuel. Pomace is a byproduct of the pressing process, and research into this topic is actually helped significantly by the continuation of traditional methods of growing and pressing olives all over the Mediterranean, especially in Turkey, but also Spain and Tunisia, which basically means that the process is not mechanized. One ton of olives pressed in this manner 
produces about 200 liters of oil and about 350 to 400 kilograms of pomace waste, or 770 to 880 pounds. Taking this waste and then transforming it into fuel for burning is actually extremely simple and essentially requires that you do basically nothing aside from forming this into bricks or spheres and then letting them dry out in the sun. So, 4 to 5 kilograms of this sun-dried pomace will burn for something like 12 hours. Although the study that did determine this doesn't actually specify if it was dried pomace or pomace made into charcoal, which you can do, it's probably sun-dried pomace, because other studies, both of the present day and of ancient sources, don't seem to find that charcoal pomace was, or is, a very common practice, because it's still used in areas that produce olive oil as a major product. My point, though, is that a relatively small amount of this will burn for a significant amount of time, and thus it is a viable fuel source, in part because it still contains, depending on how well pressed the batch is, between 3 and 12% of the oil in the waste. And when it burns, a significant portion does turn to ash, but a portion of that brick also carbonizes, and it forms fragments of carbonized olive stones which survive to varying degrees in the archaeological record. So that's what archaeologists are looking for when they're digging. Now, the studies on how burning impacts the shape of the surviving carbonized olives is not conclusive as of yet, but right now, the best understanding that archaeologists have is that if you're excavating a site, and you find the charred remains of olive pomace, if those remains have a sharp, almost broken edge, it's very, very likely that those remains were damaged during the excavation. But, if you find remains that have rounded or smooth edges, it means they very likely broke and were damaged prior to being buried by time. So if you locate a significant amount of pomace with rounded edges, it was probably used as fuel or at the very least burned as table waste. Now that being said, how would you distinguish between pomace with rounded edges used as fuel versus scrap that was burned to, you know, essentially get rid of garbage? Well, you have to take into account the whole site and what the context is of where the remains are found. So for food, a good site to point to would be Azoria in Crete dating to the Greek Archaic period, approximately 800 to 480 BC. Now, at Azoria, there was just one press to supply the town with olive oil, and the charred remains of olives were located on stone floors of houses alongside other burnt remains of food, like pulses and grains. This is essentially what you would be looking for. What was the room where the pomace was located, used for? Now in Italy, at the site of Tufariello, dating to between about 1800 and about 1400 BC, 85 fragments were recovered across a layer of ash covering 15 pottery kilns, indicating that this was used as fuel to fire the pottery. So basically it's this sort of thing. Now the use of pomace as a fuel source does appear to have declined, especially in the Aegean during the early Iron Age, for reasons that still are not that clear. But they pick up again by the Hellenistic era. And it's really in the Hellenistic period that you observe a change in the archaeology. Prior to that time, almost without fail, where you find sizable amounts of pomace, presumably used as fuel, like in a forge or a kiln and something like that, there's either an olive press in the town that's being excavated, or there's an olive press that's relatively close by. During the Hellenistic period, however, the site of Tria Platania in Greece did not have its own press, but digging at the site has recovered over 13,000 fragments of pomace from one excavation trench. In other words, it was very clearly being used as a fuel source, and it was being imported to the site. A market for this fuel was apparently developing. Now from here, we go into the Roman period. And honestly, the impact of the Roman state was massive in this regard, and one of my sources sums it up better than I probably can, stating that what sets the Roman period apart is the interrelationship between pomace use, increased olive oil production, economic growth, and the increase and expansion of industries with substantial fuel requirements. Pomace continued to serve the same domestic and industrial functions that it had for centuries. However, the production pressures exerted by the population of the empire meant that pomace fuel was introduced into new urban markets and began to play a larger role in industrial production. So the best sites we have for determining this are on the one hand Pompeii, because it can help illustrate the requirements of a city and everything is right there due to the state of preservation, 
on account of the eruption of Vesuvius and the subsequent burial of Pompeii, and thus what fuel requirements for a city probably would have looked like. And the other is the pottery industry in Roman North Africa, especially what is today Tunisia, which consumed large amounts of fuel for the production of said pottery. So let's talk about Pompeii. This city, and we'll talk more about this in the next video when we cover forestry and the use of wood, used a lot of fuel. Much of it was wood or charcoal, but the thing with wood, and even charcoal, is that this gets really heavy really fast. Now, this is not a perfect way of doing this because you're still dealing with data that's not completely exact. Not surprising because we're talking about a period 2,000 years before our own. But Robin Veal, an archaeologist based at Cambridge and who studies ancient fuel sources, came up with a way to measure how much fuel a city like Pompeii would probably need. You multiply the population by the fuel consumption, which is a percentage of raw wood and charcoal, and then you divide that by the forest production in the given region. In one of her papers, this was adjusted to Rome in order to determine how much fuel the capital would need, and the lowball estimate for Rome, taking a low population of about 600,000 and a low fuel usage, and essentially what you're looking at is a consumption of between 3,300 to 6,600 square kilometers. That's a lot of fuel, that's a lot of trees. She then scaled it up for a higher population of a million with a high fuel consumption, basically the upper limits, and naturally the amount of forest usage was much greater. Now for Pompeii, whose population at the time erupted in 79 was around 20,000, that same equation in her paper gives us a figure of about 580 to about 2300 square kilometers. So to get an idea of what this looked like, 2300 square kilometers is about one and a half times the size of Stewart Island, one of the islands that comprises New Zealand. Now, most of my subscribers are from the US, so to get a visual of what this would look like for our country, 2300 square kilometers is like two-thirds the size of Long Island. And if we take Robin Veal's figures for a high estimate of fuel for the city of Rome, then the square kilometers approximately equate to something like three quarters of the upper peninsula of Michigan. My point is that the reason the Romans didn't just cut all the trees down to meet this demand, although they probably did locally, is because they were burning olive pomace in large amounts. So it should be no surprise then that archaeologists have found large quantities of carbonized olive pomace at Pompeii, especially in the bakeries. Pompeii and its immediate surrounding region, though, did not produce olive oil, or at least not large quantities of it, which means that there would have been a market for the product and some sort of a relationship would have had to be established with olive orchards in the greater Bay of Naples area. And pomace is not just found at the bakeries, it's found in domestic contexts as well, and this matters for two reasons. The first is that many of these domestic buildings could have relied on wood or charcoal, but the evidence, which has been preserved due to the fires of Vesuvius, tells us that they actively used pomace. And the second is that it gives us an indication that people living higher up in the tenements, which were poorly ventilated, used pomace as their main heating source because it produces far less smoke than wood or charcoal. Now, if you go a little farther outside of Pompeii to Herculaneum, much of the evidence for pomace comes from one of the major sewers that collected waste from the storefronts and the apartment buildings. The volume here really just staggers the imagination. Thousands of fragments of burned olives and about 88 whole olives were found in just one section of what was excavated. So what we're looking at in terms of data here is essentially 1,140 liters of soil and debris that were excavated from the sewer, and one chunk of that, about 220 liters, revealed the 88 whole olives and over 7,000 olive fragments, which means that there's going to be even more once the other 1,200 liters have been fully processed in the lab. Now, when you head southwest across the sea and you go to North Africa, we see the industrial use of olive pomace in pottery production. The key product here is North African red slipware. Red slip meaning a type of slurry that's applied to a clay vessel to form an outer layer, kind of like a glaze. And the color of this particular slip is, you know, red, and it's made in North Africa, hence the name. North African red slipware. This particular product is used by archaeologists as a benchmark for evaluating the distribution of goods across the empire and even beyond it, because this was so common 
that it's sort of comparable to a moderately higher-end ceramics that appear in the US today and which you can buy at Walmart. So in North Africa, you would think that because large amounts of finished pottery that would be shipped are obviously pretty heavy, the production centers would be located near or at ports, but the archaeology tells us that they're not. They are, instead, generally located near centers of what archaeological work tells us were centers of olive and olive oil production. During the Roman period, the forests of North Africa were not extensive, despite the nicer climate. So, instead of wood or charcoal, the ceramics factories were utilizing the waste product from olive oil to fire the kilns, which churned out thousands of vessels each year. It was evidently cheaper to transport the finished goods over land to the ports, and to establish the kilns near the olive plantations, rather than transport the pomace to the kilns over a similar distance, simply because that much fuel was constantly required. So then not only was olive pomace a fuel source prior to the Roman era, but throughout it, and it spiked during that time frame. It formed the major alternative fuel source for the ancient and classical world, and although we are continually learning more about it, that information isn't just going to apply to our understanding of Roman history, but also potentially to our own modern-day world and the need for alternative fuels, one of which is biomass. What we don't know about this subject right now, and hopefully that changes with more digging, is what the market for olive pomace actually looked like. We know there was one because Pompeii, for instance, imported it, but we're not sure about regional scales and whether or not this was a response to a fuel shortage in those areas, which could make for some interesting research in the future. So that's it for now, guys. This particular video was a lot of fun to do, and I hope you enjoyed learning about this as much as I enjoyed researching it. So take care, everybody, and I will see you all next time.